Uh, can you do better than that? I'm the one who stayed up at 11 o'clock watching Alabama win last night. You guys got to go to bed. Good morning. Man, we're a little side heavy over here. I'm glad we're not a ship. We'd be listing to this side. But uh, so I guess that's a result of everybody wanting to come in from over those doors. I know you want to come in those doors. But anyway, enough of that. I'd like to invite you, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, as we now begin to get into the meat of the book that James is... Um, written to these folks who have been spread abroad due to all the persecution that was taking place in their day and age. And so as we look at this, we get into the real issues that he wants to address. So chapter 1 was really just a matter of presenting the perspectives that we need, the perspectives on uh, trials and what's their purpose, the perspective on temptation to see that trials and temptations, same words used, it's all dependent on how we respond to it. So when we respond incorrectly to the trials of life, it can lead us into temptation. And then, and then finally, James wanted to just help us understand the perspective on righteousness. It's about submitting ourselves to the Word of God and allowing it to be our guide. And so now, he's going to be touching all in all these hot topics, so to speak, these difficult circumstances that we have to navigate and we have to be careful as we w walk our way through them. And the first one is a very hot topic indeed, even for our day, because James wants to talk about the issue of, of favoritism or showing partiality. And uh, our country continues to to erupt over the issues of injustice and racism, and there are all kinds of things going on, and we have all different kinds of views concerning them. But really, when you get right down to it, all of this stems from what James talks about here in chapter 2. That's why it's so important to understand it. And we see the ugliness as it erupts again. This is very similar to what I remember from the 60s when I was growing up and, and recognizing as living in a, as a young boy in Birmingham, Alabama, when the church was bombed and all that stuff that went on there. I, I remember those things and, and remember the, the, the unrest that took place. And so, you know, it, it's showing its ugly face again and we, we can ask the question, well, where does all this stuff really come from? And the simple answer is, well, sin. Sin is the reason. And, but we need to understand that there's a, a slippery slope that we all face if we do not guard our hearts against the subtle assumptions and attitudes that can creep into even our hearts and can creep into the church. We have to be very, very careful concerning that. And so as we look at James chapter 1, or 2, Two, verses 1 through 13, I want to define a few terms here, and I've got a, a, a chart that I want to throw up here as I work my way through that, but here's what I want you to understand. We have these things that are called cliques, and they, they form all the time. They form around common interests and, and, and enjoyment, and so, you know, I'm, I'm with, I, I get together on Thursday nights with a group of guys. We have common interests, and we just share life together, and it's a great experience. And some might look at that and say, well, that's a click. Well, can I get into that? Well, no. But anyway, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but there's clicks, and, and we have them all the time. We, 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 we like certain things. Um, there's, there's this click in here in New England called the New England Patriots fans. You guys get together and you talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get together, you talk about it. And when you talk about it, I just kind of go like... <sighs> But that's you. That, I don't want to be part of that club or that clique. You can be part of that clique. That's okay. And, and what we need to understand, they're held together by these common interests of views or purpose. And they're neutral in general terms. It can be neutral. However, there's, there's potential danger that lies in the attitudes and the purposes of that particular clique. And so you have that word that gets thrown around, and it gets thrown around a lot of times in churches, and you got the new people and the old people, you got the young people and the young old people, you got all these different, what we might call cliques that are out there. There's another word that we need to understand, and that's this word prejudice. And prejudice has a definition, although it gets misused and misunderstood oftentimes, but prejudice is an opinion, a thought, or a feeling based on assumptions 
not necessarily facts, but on assumptions made about an individual or a segment of society without getting to know them. So we make a judgment. And this happens all the time as well. And we have to be careful that we, we, we recognize it when it's happened. We just make an assumption based on a, a particular set of facts that we may have or understand. Then you got this word, uh, well, we don't have it up here, but get this word racism that I want to help you understand. Because you see, racism does not really happen unless there's power. So prejudice defines the characteristics of the in and the out group. It, it, it can be fueled by cultural biases that may take place. It can be promoted as normal. Therefore, it makes sense. It's rational because of the experiences of so, and socialization of the idea. For example, when I first became very much aware of the social tensions as I was growing up and, and there was the desegregation of schools and there were fights and all this kind of stuff and, and I, I was beaten up twice, thrown downstairs once and some guy wanted to clobber me with a stick because he wanted a quarter and I was of the wrong group. So I remember all this stuff and I remember that it was difficult and I became much more aware of the tensions. I didn't necessarily understand them, but I was aware of them. And so I, I did some, I did a paper on it, I did some research, and, and I remember talking to my mom one day as I was going through the information, as I was looking back in the history of America and how the, you actually did have racism that was rampant because you had prejudice with power. And so you had these things called white water fountains and black water fountains. And I, I remember going to my mom and I go, Mom, you, you, you were a Christian during this time, right? She says, yeah. I said, Mom, can you help me understand how you thought it was okay to have a white water fountain and a black water fountain? I mean, how, how, how does that fit into what we know about Scripture? I don't understand, Mom. What, how? She said, son, that's just the way it was. We didn't think about it. Now, that doesn't excuse it, but it helps us understand how prejudice is formed. It's culturally biased. It becomes normalized. It's just, just the way it is. You go, into, you go into certain cultures. I've had the opportunity to travel to different cultures. And what's acceptable in that culture is totally different than what's acceptable in ours. I, I, I remember, I think I've told you this story. I remember when I was dating a girl in high school, she came from Kansas. And she, she was talking about how she was so happy to be in Alabama because now was the, 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 the season where they were spreading manure all over the fields out there in Kansas. But she didn't use the word manure. She used another word that was a four-letter word. And she said it in the Bible College Student Union building. And she said it out loud like it was normal. Because it was normal. She grew up in a farming community. And they weren't spreading manure. They were spreading. And I'm like, shh, don't say that word. We're going to get in trouble. They're going to give us demerits. But it was normal. So you have all these different kinds of an example. But here's what we need to understand as we come to this, this, this passage. And we need to understand. You can have cliques and you can have prejudice. And cliques can be neutral if they have the right motivations and the purposes. But if this gets involved, then this becomes negative. And when you add power to it, that's where oppression and racism comes in. Because racism is prejudice with power, when you have the power to put you somebody under your thumb according to your prejudices. And that's what James is wanting to talk about. He's wanting to get at this stuff and make sure we understand so that we don't get this power thing going with oppression or racism. So it's with that backdrop that I just want to read you this passage and listen to what it says here. James chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers... Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man is wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and comes into your assembly, a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to one who wears the fine clothing and say, sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, stand over there or sit down at my feet. 
or become my footstool, something for me to rest my feet on. Then he goes on to say, he says, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, James says some very strong things about this partiality and favoritism that goes on. He says, you, you have evil thoughts. Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who have oppressed you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme for the honorable and name a name by which you are called? If you really if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall not love your neighbor. You shall I mean, you, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are, are are doing well, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for it all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. And if you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so the church not only needs to confront the prejudice and racism when it shows its ugly heads within our ranks, it needs to battle the very attitudes and the assumptions that lead to the practice of racism and prejudice. It is important to recognize, as we've read this passage together, that diversity within the body of Christ is by design and by command. By design and command. And so, if these attitudes and assumptions that James wants us to address are in the church, they need to be dealt with. So that the church does not step into, step into the mud puddle of racism or prejudice. Here's what we need to understand as we begin to, to unpack this this morning. This is what we have to understand. When we have hearts, when we have hearts that practice favoritism of one group over another, we have moved away from the design and the command of God for the church. I want you to hear that. I want you to listen very well to what's being said. When we practice this, one group over another, we have moved away from the design and the command of God for the church. There's no other way to look at it. We have moved away from what God has called us to be. And therefore, it is, as James says, it is sin and it needs to be eradicated. So let's just pray and ask God to bless us as we look into his word this morning. Father, we thank you for your truth. And your words just sound eternal again once more for us because what was true in James's day is true in ours. We recognize the also subtleness of this dangerous trend. We see the ugliness when it is not recognized or not dealt with. And we pray that we will be a people who will understand the responsibility we have to love. And so guide us in your truth this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, look with me, if you will, as we've just read through the first four verses of chapter four, because those first four verses just basically give us a prohibition against favoritism. This is not to be part of what you are as a church. Then verse five down through verse 11 gives you the argument against favoritism. Why is God saying this to us? And then, verses 12 and 13, there's a plea that comes out from James for consistency. So let's first of all just look at the prohibition, verses 1 through 4. Verse 1, it's stated, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, as you seek to live out your faith, do not show partiality or favoritism in any way. 
And then he illustrates it for us, something that was very common in James' day, and, and to a certain degree, it's still common today, where the rich can oppress the poor or take advantage. It was very common, and it was exactly what was coming in. And so James provides this little example of the rich and the poor in verses uh, 2 and 3, and he talks about if this were to happen, that somebody rich comes in and you give them the, the front row seat. Well, here at Calvary Bible Church, that would not be the place of honor. It would be that seat back there with the Smiths. That's the place of honor. That's where everybody wants to be. So it doesn't matter where you place them. The point is, is that when you say, oh, oh sit here because we really like you, and then you tell somebody else to go stand in the back or, or to, to just become my footstool is the word that is used here, something to rest my feet on. And, and back in that day, your feet were considered to be disgusting and, and, and not to be placed on anybody. It would have been the, the epitome of, of, of really showing disrespect. So that's the idea. If you show respect for one group as opposed to disrespect for the other, what you're involved in is sinful. Look what he says in verses 2 and 3. He says, For if this man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes in your suddenly, and a poor man in shabby clothing, and you pay attention, that word there, you give honor, you give respect to the one who has a lot and disrespect the other one, he says, he says verse 4, Have you not then made distinctions? Have you not shown uh, partiality? And he draws a conclusion here in verse 4, and it's a very strong conclusion. Have you not then made distinctions among you and become judges with evil thoughts? James doesn't pull any punches here. He doesn't say, well, you know, it's, it's sort of understandable or, um, you know, it's just the way things are. No, James says this is wrong. This is sin. This is a reflection of evil thoughts. That's why it needs to be dealt with. That's why you don't need to pretend like it's not something that needs to be addressed or it's not something that's serious. When we do not address it, that's when we head down this slippery slope and we end up in situations like we see all around us or we have seen in our history as a country and even in the church and so we cannot, here's the point, we cannot pretend that favoritism and discrimination in the church is insignificant because they are evidence of a heart that is in need of spiritual help, spiritual help. We can't just pretend as if they're not a big deal. They are a big deal. And James wants us to understand this is, this is an indication of what's really in the heart. It's an area of the heart that needs to be dealt with and dealt with correctly. We are not allowed to make such distinctions. We can't say to this group, you're not welcome here. We can't pay honor to one and dishonor to another. That is inconsistent with who we are as we hold to the faith, as we seek to live out the truth of the gospel. We'll see that unpacked even further as we move through. He makes his argument, verses 5 through 11. He talks about how such distinction making, as he said in verse 4, is inconsistent with God's action. Look at verse 5. Verse 5, he says this, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and the heirs of the kingdom? He's pointing to them. He's saying, look, hasn't God chosen you who have no financial wherewithal to be rich, rich in what God has given you and rich in faith and the promises and the inheritance? It's inconsistent for you to be down doing this in public when you have experienced God's grace. Now, I think what he's, he's moved beyond just the simple financial aspects here. I think he's also talking about the fact that, that, that you are spiritually bankrupt. We who had sin in our lives, all of us which are guilty of our sin, as you study the book of Romans, as you study other passages, there was none that could save themselves. There was no one that was good enough to be saved. There was absolutely no merit within me for God to save me. It was all based on God's grace. God worked in my heart miraculously. He chose me to be one of his children. I will never get over that, but it's not because I was something special. I was not. 
It was simply a matter of God's grace and mercy in my life. And so how dare I think that, that I deserve it and somebody else doesn't? That's, that's the point that he's making here. It's inconsistent with what God's done for you. Now, obviously, there was cultural issues where the rich were oppressing the poor and, and whatnot. But, but I think is, there's a broader point that he's making here. And he goes on to even illustrate that in verse 6 down through verse 11, where he talks about it violates the royal law, the royal law being that we are to love one another. It's what he says in verses 6 and 7. This is very consistent with what we see in our day. Look at 6. He says, but you have dishonored the poor man, and are not the rich the ones who, who oppress you and the ones who drag you in the court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? In other words, why are you, you uh, showing this uh, great honor to the rich who are dragging you through the mud, so to speak, who have oppressed you? Why are you doing that? You're doing wrong. It's consistent with what we see all around us. We see these distinctions being made. We see the segregation. We see all the, the ugliness of racism and prejudice as it runs rampant around the world. We see that. Why would we want to be a part of that? It's consistent with what we see in the world, but we are called to be different. We've been called out of that, and we've been given a responsibility to live out our faith, and that is to be lived out in a way that is consistent with what God's done for us and who God is. Verse 9, he makes another very strong statement where he says, but if you show partiality or favoritism, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law of the transgressors. So again, James makes it very clear. This isn't something we can pretend about. This is something that's very ser serious. Favoritism or showing favoritism is a sin. And he's talking in the context of the church or the assembled believers. And then verses 10 and 11, he, he uses an illustration from the Old Testament law. He, the, in the law, it's very clear that when, you were, when we were under the law, and he talks about us being under liberty now, but under the law, if you violated one, you violated it all because the God who says don't commit murder says don't do this. And so you can't make those distinctions. And I think the point that James is trying to get here, because he's writing primarily to a Jewish audience who would have understood what he's talking about, under the Old Testament law, you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all. Basic principle that James is trying to get across here, you can't pick and choose when it comes to the Word of God. You can't say, oh, well, I want to obey this part, but I really don't want to obey that part. Or I should be able to do this, even though it says that, well, you know, it's not a big deal. No, we can't pick and choose. You see, genuine faith is not looking to pick and choose what is convenient to obey. Genuine faith is rather lived out and surrendered to God's will and desire in all matters of the heart and practice. It's not a matter of saying, well, I like this or I don't like it. It is a matter of an understanding that God has called us to surrender to all what God has commanded. This ties back into what he just talked about in James chapter 1. The role of the Word of God in genuine righteousness is that we bring ourselves under the surrender of. And so when God comes to us and says, showing favoritism to one group over another is sin, then we need to recognize that, pull back from that, and operate differently. And that's how he closes this passage out. He closes it out with this this idea of a plea for consistency. Verses 12 and 13. Look, look at what he says here in verses 12 and 13. He says, So speak and act at those who are judged under the law of liberty. We've been set free from the law. We have been made those who are under God's grace. And he's saying, act and live as those who have experienced God's graciousness apart from merit of our own. But he has liberally and graciously called us to be his children. He has given us freedom from our sin. And now walk as those who walk in liberty. Now keep in mind, the scripture is very clear that we are not uh, to be set free to live in sin. And to violate God's law, that's what he just established. That's why in chapter 1, he sets these perspectives. You've got to keep coming back to them. You have to be underneath the, the, the authority of God's word in your life. 
But you've been set free from sin. You've been set free from the, the, the boundaries that are existing in your world. You've been made a child of the king. You've been made free to follow him and to enjoy him forever. But I think what he also wants us to understand is that we need to bring ourselves into conformity to the God's word. Now, I want us to do a little Bible um, reading here this morning. Look with me at a couple of passages of scripture. And I want you to follow along. Turn with it, if you will, to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and following. Because what you're going to hear here this morning is that this is consistent with what others have said. This is consistent with what God has called us to be. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Here's what it says. Verse 11, we'll look down from there down to verse 18. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. What is, what is Paul talking about here? He's talking about the division between the Jew and the Gentile. He's talking about the fact that the church struggled early on. Acts chapter 15. How Jewish do you have to be in order to be really saved? Do you have to keep the law plus accept Jesus Christ as sacrifice for your sins? And the result of Acts chapter 15 was, no, we were saved by grace. We couldn't fulfill the law as Jews. We can't expect the Gentiles to do it either. We all come together under the grace of God who sent his son to die on the cross for our sins, to take care of our sin problem, and to give us life everlasting. That's what we have. And so what he's saying here is, remember, there was a time when you were called Gentiles and you were called Jews or you were called the uncircumcised and the circumcised. As a matter of fact, the Jews had a name for the Gentiles. They called them dogs. That's the way they referred to them. So there was no love between the two groups. There was division. So you can imagine in the early church when those two groups started coming together, it created major problems. Paul addresses it head on here. Here's what he says. He says, remember, this is what you were called. Verse 12, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promises, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances that he may create in himself a one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Turn over, if you will, to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Paul again addressing this same issue. Verse 26 through 29. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 29. Here's what it says. 4, verse 26. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God. We're made part of the family of God through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. For as many as you who are baptized into Christ and have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek or Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise." Turn over, if you will, to the book of Colossians. Paul again addressing this issue. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11. Colossians chapter 3 verse 11, it says this. He says, here there is not, and he's talking about the church, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian or scathian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. 
So he goes on to say, as we come together in this thing we call Christianity, or we bring ourselves under the authority of God and His Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, regardless of where we come from, what group, what clique, what sect, what, what uh, nation, what nationality, what skin color, whatever it may be, as we come together in Christ, Christ is in us, and we now are what is called the body of Christ. That's why there is to be no favoritism. Look with me, if you will, one more passage, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 11 through 13. Here's what, here's what Paul says. For with the heart one believes and is justified. With the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, every one. Every one, regardless of where they come from, regardless of what station in life they may be, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Paul says, listen, we need to live out. I mean, James, James, Paul says it and James says it back in James chapter 2. says the same thing. So speak and so act as those who are judged under the law of liberty. You've been set free. You no longer have to live in the way that you did. You no longer have to live the way the world does. You live as those who have been brought together as one in Christ Jesus, period. To think otherwise is sin. It's wrong. And it doesn't belong in the church. And then he, he, he gives one more point. He says it's consistency with the demands to live out our beliefs, verse 12. But also consistency provides confidence in the judgment. Here's what he says. In verse, For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It's very similar to what Jesus says in the Beatitudes as he works his way through it. Here's his point. If you've received mercy from God, which we have if we placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you've received that mercy, then you are to be those who extend it to others. If you have been loved by God, then you are to love others. If you have been given graciously the riches of God, you should expect to be able to share those same riches with others. Here's the point that we want to conclude with. Partiality. Partiality, favoritism, racism, prejudice, whatever you want to call it. Partiality is inconsistent with the Christian faith because the Christian faith is inconsistent. Or the Christian faith is consistent with the nature of God and God is holy impartial. I got this quote from John MacArthur's uh, commentary on the subject. I think it's great. I think you need to listen to it. If, if we are, like we said in chapter 1, remember what it said in chapter 1, the perspectives. There's going to be trials. We're faced with trials today. How are we going to respond to them? Either we're going to understand that God is going to use them to grow us and mature us and to prepare us to reach and to accomplish, reach our world and accomplish His vision, or it's going to break us down and we're going to succumb to our fleshly desires and temptations. And it will become a breaking down of our character because we are refusing to bring ourselves under the authority of God's word. That's what he's talking about here. The consistency uh, that we will have as we approach that judgment, as we recognize we can come with recognizing that we have been given much, much has been required of us, and we have the opportunity to live in light of that. And we know that when we live as God has called us, when we approach the, the time when we meet Him, there's going to be confidence. Confidence knowing that we have been consistent with who God has called us to be. Confidence in knowing that we will be able to hear that well done, good and faithful servant. Years ago, and it's been years now, here at Calvary, I'm going to tell you a story, okay? And when I tell this story, you're not allowed to ask me who. 
okay, because it happened at this church years ago, long before all you were here, of course, years ago, we were having a service and somebody showed up with a pink spiked mohawk. It's quite interesting. The young man came in, sat down, sat down just about back there. I, I, I remember it like it was just yesterday, but it was years ago before any of you were here, I'm sure. Somebody came up to me after the service and said this, Pastor Talley, I'm really surprised that you didn't ask that young man to leave. It was so distracting. It was so disrespectful that he came in here with his mohawk and his pink hair. I'm really surprised that you didn't ask them to leave. I, I think God gave me a moment there to be able to respond. And all I said to him, well, I'm sorry it was a distraction to you, but I'm just glad they came to hear the word of God. That's all I'm happy about. And there were crickets after that comment. They just kind of looked at me and then said, oh, and walked away. Now, I know, I know there's these, all these kinds of unwritten rules or expectations that sometimes we have as church. And, and, and trust me, you will never see me. I know you know this already, but you will never see me have a pink mohawk. I guarantee it. You won't see me have a tattoo. I'm afraid of needles. There's no way. I mean, everybody talk about the vaccine. I can't wait to get the vaccine. I'm like, no, no, you can't have my body. No, no. And it has nothing to do with being anti-vaxxer. It means that I'm a sissy when it comes to needles. So there's no way I'm getting a tattoo. I even, I'm even afraid of those ones that you lick and you put on your arm. You know, I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want, I don't want any of that. Cause, so I know there's these things. And we can allow those things to become divisive. But here's the point. If we're going to be on mission for God... If we're going to go out there and reach this world, if we do start reaching the world, there are going to be people who are going to come inside and be part of us. There may be a little different. And we better be prepared. And we better be on guard and not say, ooh, you, you, fit, you fit this. Frank Garland used to say a phrase, and I loved it, and I adopted it. He said, you know, there was a time in our church when it went like this. If you show me the look... I will show you the book. In other words, you've got to conform to the image that we have before we'll give you this. Calvary Bible Church, that's not what God's called us to do. The only reason we may have the look is because God has graciously saved us. And because we understand what this book says, we now have a way that we know to live, but we don't sit in judgment on others. Doesn't mean we don't call sin sin. Doesn't mean we compromise or anything that we believe or the structures that God gives us here in the Word of God, but we better be careful for the motivations that drive us. Because our world has turned ugly, because there are those who have chosen to be partial. There are those who have chosen to say, this group is acceptable, this is not. This group is expendable, this is not. That is not to be who we are as a church. And we need to be on guard. James says, those kinds of attitudes are sin. They are evil. And they don't belong here. Because that's not who God is. And that's not who we are to be. So I pray that we will listen to his word. And we will think. And we will not assume that we have none of this stuff. Because we all struggle with it. But let's, go out, let's struggle with what God's word says. And live out God's truth. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We recognize that our country, our world is being torn apart as a result of all of these kinds of things. And we see the damage that even happens in churches too. Sometimes it's not as ugly as what we see in our culture right now, but it's just as damaging to the body of Christ. And we need to be on guard. So I pray that the words that we have learned this morning and listened to, that we will allow our hearts to be molded to your truth, to live out your truth rather than ours. We will allow your character to be the guide for what our character is to be. 
so that we can reflect you and we can reach your lost and dying world. God, do a work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.